Good morning. Welcome to EFC Online. Uh, before we get started, uh, I want to uh, mention something, and um, it's a, it's an announcement, but it's it's a hopeful announcement. And so, uh, we are going to try in some form to meet together on August the second. So right now, all I can say is uh, watch your email, uh, watch your inbox, and. Uh, the church Facebook page, and uh, you know we will uh, try to make those things known as soon as we know how things are working out. Uh, there's a lot of widgets and stuff connected to being able to do that, but we are we're working toward that goal. And uh, if all works together, we will be somewhat together again, which is better than not what together again. So be praying about it, and uh, uh, hopefully um, we'll see that happen next week. That would be a fun thing. In the meantime, would you find 1 John chapter 2? And, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, we talked about already the book of 1 John is about fellowship with God. There are these reoccurring themes that describe the characteristics of those who know God and are walking in fellowship with God. And, and it is seen in where they walk. It's seen in how they love, in what they believe. And so up to this point, we've been talking about the walk aspect. We talked about walking in the light. We talked about walking in reality. And in, in verse 3 of chapter 2, John turns now to this second characteristic as he discusses how we are to love. We want to walk in love. Beginning in verse 3, now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. And the old commandment is the word which you've heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now there are uh, several things I want us to focus on this morning as we look in this passage. And um, I want to begin by asking this question, what are these commandments that he's talking about? Okay, uh, you know, verse, verse 3, um, he says, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Well, what are those? When we hear the word, commandment, we immediately think of the Ten Commandments, the law of God. The Ten Commandments were written on two tablets of stone given to Moses uh, up on Mount Sinai during the exodus of the people of God in the middle of the wilderness. And the first tablet contained requirements concerning man's relationship with God. The second tablet contained laws concerning man's relationship with each other. Now when John says, he who knows him keeps his commandments, is, is he referring to those ten commandments? Is that what he means? I would say a definitive yes and no. Remember in Matthew 22, Jesus is asked a question, what is the greatest commandment? And he gives, 
you know, an incredible response. He, and he says, you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And that's the first and great commandment. And he says, the second one is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, on those two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. And so he basically distills 10 down to two, simplifying it for simpletons like me. I can get that. I can understand that. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, okay? Focus on those two things, and everything else will fall into place. So when John says, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments, that's what he's referring to. The most basic commandment to love God and to love others. The second thing, what makes these commandments so new? At first glance, it seems like a contradiction. In verse 7, he says, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. But then in verse 8, he says, I'm writing a new commandment to you. What does it mean? The Greeks had two words in their languages for the word new. One of them represented being new in time. The other represented new in a sense of emphasis or quality. In other words, we would use the first word to describe the latest model of a car. I got a, a, a brand new Hyundai Santa Fe, and it's a 2020. It's the latest model, and that means it's new in time. Chronologically, it's new. But if we purchase a car that was radically different from every other car, that it just looked radically different, that it runs on Mountain Dew, and that it's a whole different kind of an animal, we would use the second word. It's new in emphasis or quality. So in verse 7, when John says, I write no new commandment to you, he means that it's not new in time. It's not something you haven't heard or seen before. It's not a new thing in a, in a chronology of time. In fact, he says, you've known this from the beginning. And, and by that, he means from the beginning of their faith. You've understood this from the time you've put your faith in Jesus. And, and this wasn't an afterthought in God's mind, you know. Oh, oh, oh yeah, we're, we're being saved, you know, and, and that's a good thing. But I also want you to love each other. That would be a good thing. It's not an afterthought. Um, as I mentioned before, Jesus explained that all of the commandments are summed up in these two, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So this is not a brand new thing we're talking about here. It's not new in time, but it's new in emphasis, and it's new in quality. Why? Because it's never been demonstrated the way it was in the life of Jesus. They've never seen love demonstrated the way Jesus demonstrated love. He redefined it, essentially. It's what John means in verse 8. He says it's a new commandment. It's a new thing. It's a new emphasis. It's the same thing, uh, the word that Jesus used in John 13, in verses 34 and 35, when he said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. They had always had the commandment to love one another. But he's giving the commandment new emphasis when he says, Love one another the way that I've loved you. That's a game changer. That's a game changer. And, and people these days all the time are shouting about, you know, when you disagree with them, you know, as a Christian, well, I thought God was love. I thought God was, God is love. But love is not God. Because there's a love the likes of which you have never even fathomed. A profound, mind-blowing love of eternal proportions. And the new emphasis was a new example Notice John says in verse 8, which thing is true in him. It's a new example <clears throat> to love one another as he loved them, as they saw love demonstrated by his life. It was the love of Jesus that led him to leave the glory of heaven and come to earth. Again, in 1 John, uh, 
4, it says God is love. And, and Jesus exemplified that in his life. Because if you want to understand God, if you want to see God and know God, you look at Jesus. How did Jesus do life? And he exemplified love in his life. So we know that God is love because the way Jesus lived life. Wouldn't it be fun to know that people know God because the way we exemplify love in our lives? See, he's a walking, talking demonstration of the love of God to people. And because of that, the people liked to be where he was. They just liked being around him. Luke 15 records, it says, even the worst of sinners drew near to him. Um, in John chapter 4, it says that people marveled at the gracious words that he spoke. See, they're used to the religious leaders of their day coming down on them, laying all kinds of legalistic trips on them. Not Jesus. See, Jesus is a burden bearer, not a burden bringer. Now let me ask you an honest question. And it's difficult to ask because of the, the way that it reflects on me as well as you. Have you ever actually prayed Psalm 19, verse 14, not quoted it, have you ever prayed it and say, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. See, that's Jesus. He's gracious with people. And there's a culture of millions of people who have no idea that Jesus is gracious and kind and loving and forgiving. Actually, because of some in the church, many believe that Jesus is a, a, a racist, homophobic, bigoted, xenophobic, misogynistic religious leader of some kind. Listen. Listen. People wanted to hang out with him. They wanted to hear from him. They wanted who he had. They wanted who he was. And, and he would get away at times with the disciples, and the crowd just followed along. And it, and it never says that he was annoyed by that. He was never annoyed by that. He wasn't feeling inconvenienced. Uh, he looked on them with compassion. Because love would lead Jesus to see people differently. According to Matthew uh, 11, I think, he looked at people as sheep without a shepherd. And so what did he do? He touched lepers, the unclean. He touched them. He ministered to outsiders, outcasts, weirdos. <laughs> And he was really patient with the inconsistencies and even the unbelief of his own disciples. And then, of course, his greatest demonstration of love is seen at the cross. So the commandment was new because Jesus gave it a new example and a new emphasis. Love one another as I have loved you. Number three, why is this commandment such a priority for Jesus? Was it because he wants to experience the joy of being in a family where the defining mark is love? Or is it just because he wants his children to get along with each other? Sure, but I think the, the reason is deeper than that, okay? There's a bigger reason on his heart than just our benefit, okay? If, if you're sitting in front with, of your Bible there, turn to John chapter 13. And, and you know this stuff. You know this passage. But we need to revisit it about this, this issue and this subject. In John 13 and verse 34 he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another 
as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, all will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And the reason Jesus emphasized that wasn't just for the sake of unity. Unity is great, but that's, that's not the big picture. And the focus isn't tolerance, so we can all get along in spite of our differences. The focus is on the world at large, okay? He's saying, I want the world to see something so different in you that they will be prone to wonder and even ask, why are you so loving? Why are you so giving? Family, we, we have to keep this in mind during any discussion we enter into dealing with the subject of love and unity, that his focus is on the world. That's how the world is going to know you're my disciples, by your love. The world was constantly on his heart, constantly in his thinking. Because here's the thing. Jesus understood that God designed people with a need for companionship. And as a result, Jesus knew that people would be struggling with issues, loneliness, deep emptiness in life. I came across an interesting story where loneliness wound up being big business for one an entrepreneurial guy who placed an ad in the classifieds of their paper. And the ad said, I will listen to you talk for 35 minutes without comment for $5. And you know what? He got a lot of calls in response every day. And he made some significant money in the process. I think it's a good illustration of how the pain of loneliness can be so great that some people will do almost anything just for a half hour of companionship. I posted a verse on Facebook this week. Psalm 142 and verse 4. Look on my right hand and see, for there is no one who acknowledges me. And I wrote about the very widespread need for people to feel acknowledged to feel cared for, to feel listened to. Everyone knows what it's like to experience loneliness. You've been there, I've been there, in a crowded room, and all of a sudden, this momentary loneliness just sweeps over you. And you feel like there's no one there but you. Pastor Greg Laurie wrote something really interesting. He said, loneliness is also a reason why people get emotionally or sexually involved outside of marriage. Often girls are sweet-talked by guys to jump into bed with them. It's been said that men give love to get sex and girls give sex to get love. I don't know. Think about it. A guy might say to a girl, I love you so much. You're the girl of my dreams. I would marry you. But those promises are rarely, if ever, remembered the next day. Oftentimes, there are, there are girls who will agree to have sex in hopes of receiving love. They want to be appreciated. They feel the need to be cared for. They want someone to be concerned about them. And it all comes down to loneliness. I think it's why we see an epidemic of, of unwed mothers, abortions, sexually transmitted diseases that, that are just like plaguing our society. Because people are constantly turning to sex to try and fill the emptiness that they feel inside. You know, and, and, and what he says was written really a number of years ago. Um, and I, I might add that there's actually a new bravado included in current sexual ideas and behaviors. 
there's there's much more forwardness and and talk very open talk and and stuff that that is is not would have never been i know i sound like that guy i turned 65 last week and all of a sudden i'm curmudgeon guy i don't think i am but i think that that we see this time when when whatever social media all everything tiktok and everything there are just these people that are just so open uh, about sexuality and and there's no mystery you know there, there's 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 no sacredness and no one can escape the truth we are created to be in community we were invested with the need to love and be loved a few years ago, a study was done by the American Medical Association in conjunction with the National Board of Education. And they found that more than half the students in junior and senior high school drink. And, and thousands of them say they go out and get drunk every week. It's just another symptom of this deep emptiness and meaninglessness in the lives of our young students today. Maybe you know what it's like to be lonely, to, to feel hurt, and to be rejected. Maybe you aren't, or maybe you weren't the, the big man on campus in school. Maybe you weren't the prom queen. Maybe you were not the center of attention. Could be when you were growing up, your parents moved around a lot, and you changed schools so frequently, you never had a chance to form lasting friendships. Well, Jesus knew that people would be dealing with these types of struggles, and his heart went out to them. And he knew they needed an answer. And he provided an answer. What's the answer? The answer is the church. The church. He, he says, I want the world to see my love in you. And he expresses the same sentiments in John 17 when he was praying for unity among his disciples, that, that they would be one just as you and I, Father, are one. But then he added, I don't want you to take them out of the world. In fact, I'm sending them into the world, but they need to be one. The world needs to see their love. Paul shares the same idea, Philippians 1, 27. He says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Again, the focus is on the gospel. Lives that are united together are going to be a testimony. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. In other words, your lives will have a much bigger impact for the message of the gospel, a more powerful effect, if they see your love. The witness to the world is our love, the defining mark on our lives that we know him. See, being disciples is seen in our love for one another and the world. I heard about a, a, a Bible translator, a Wycliffe Bible translator. His name was Doug Meland. His wife and he moved to a village in Brazil to minister to the Fulino Indians. And when he got there, he was simply referred to as the white man. And it wasn't a compliment because they had already been exploited and taken advantage of by white men. They set themselves to learn the language and they began to help the community with medicine and, and, and other things. And over time, they, they changed and they began to refer to him as the respectable white man. And it says that one day they, they see Doug washing the dirty, smelly, bloody foot of a young Indian boy. 
And from that point on, they began to refer to him as the man God sent us. See, true Christian love transcends color and race and social status. The world will know we are his disciples by our love. Now, number four, how do I make this love the driving force of my life? John gives us the answer to our passage, if you go back to 1 John there. And you remember Jesus declared that all the commands are summed up in these two. Love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. And the one thing the Bible points out for us is that this second command is really the byproduct of the first. If you love God with all of your heart, you will find that he will be working in you. And he'll be making you to be a person who naturally and organically loves other people. And that's what John explains here in verse 5 when he says, Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. Whoever keeps his word, the first commandment, uh, the love of God is perfected or completed in him. And then he says, by this we know we are in him. That's how we know. Paul puts it this way in Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That's, such, that's a really radical truth that John and Paul are making, explaining very specifically that this is a work that God does in your heart. God's love is poured out in you by the Holy Spirit when you give your life to Jesus. And as the Spirit begins to work in your heart, you begin to look at things and others differently. Before you come to Jesus, what's your primary focus? Yourself. Your focus is primarily on yourself. And your thoughts were toward yourself. How to please you. How to take care of you, satisfy you, meet your needs, self-care. Even when a kind act was done by us, there was this undercurrent of thought or concern inside of, well, how will this affect me? See, that's what we call the sin nature. The number one focus is on self, how we satisfy and how we gratify how we please. And, and so many times in marriage counseling, when some kind of a betrayal has taken place, and the person who was hurt will say, but he or she told me they loved me. And really, truthfully, they did. But here's the thing. They love themselves more. They love themselves more. But as the Holy Spirit in us begins to work in our lives as he begins to transform us into those who are more others-centered than self-centered. And the longer that person walks with the Lord, the love of God, it says, is perfected in them. That word means completed in them. So that you find yourself seeing others the way he sees others. And you actually want to then treat others differently. You innately want to treat others differently. And, and that particular work of God in you is so incredible. So incredible. Verse 6, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. He, he, he explains it further by drawing from this idea that he had heard Jesus teach on the night before his death. In John 15, and, 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 and in, in there Jesus describes the Christian life in connection with a vine. He is the vine, we are the branches. And the only way we as branches are to be able to bear fruit is if we abide in him. That word abide, it means to continue with. It's the key to fruit bearing. Okay, It's a great illustration. 
because, because that branch that becomes disconnected from the vine, what happens? Well, it shrivels up and it dies. But if it stays connected to the vine, it just naturally brings forth fruit. There's no straining. There's no effort. You know, there's, uh, I got to make this fruit. The Holy Spirit is completely at work in him or her. So, what is the fruit? What is that fruit that he's talking about? Well, it's found in Galatians 5. We call it the fruit of the Spirit. And when you read it, it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, long death. But the, but the way it's written originally is that the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then all of those following characteristics are byproducts of that love. Joy is love's rejoicing. Peace is love's calming. Long-suffering is, is love's patience, so on and so forth. When we abide in Jesus, the fruit that comes out from our lives is going to resemble him. Okay, You read Galatians 5, and you read that passage, the fruit of the Spirit, Love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, self-control. Those are all the perfect description of Jesus. And so that's what John means when he says, he who says he abides ought to walk as he walked. See, ought doesn't mean you should, like it's a requirement. The word ought in the original is a necessity in the nature of the case. In other words, it's, it has to do with natural characteristics. Okay. Why does a dog bark? Because it's a dog. In the same way, Christians love because they are walking with Jesus and the Holy Spirit is in them. And the work is being done in us by him as we abide in him. Yielding to the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. Okay? Number five. What if I don't keep this commandment to love? What if I don't do it? I see three things. He says, first of all, when that happens, that person doesn't know what they're talking about. And they can say, I know God all they want. But if they don't love, he says they're a liar, essentially. And then he says, that person is in darkness. They're in darkness. That means you're not thinking clearly. It means that you don't, you can't discern the stuff of life. You don't know how to make decisions well. If you don't love like Jesus loved, you're living in a, in a darkness of some kind. And then the third thing is that they become, it says, a stumbling block in verses 10 and 11 to others rather than a stepping stone. And so the world looks on and it says, wait, aren't you guys supposed to be loving now, someone might say, okay, Roar, if love is to be the natural fruit coming out of the Christian who is abiding in Christ, why is there so much judging that goes on in Christian circles? Why, why can gossip be such a problem in church? Why is it that a person can go to a church for a year or more and feel like no one has even noticed them or reached out to them? Why is it that a person can be out of fellowship for weeks and never hear from anyone? Now, we could simply answer, it's human nature. People are people. People aren't perfect. We're, we're all sinners. That's all true. But I think the problem's deeper. I think a lot of Christians have never understood the process of abiding and bearing fruit that we see taught by Jesus in the gospel, especially John's. And then the way John talks, applies it to our lives here in this, in this letter. This is a big deal. It's it's time for the church to love people. 
Stop communicating things to people that make them feel your sense of superiority or, or more mental fitness or even worse, spiritual prowess. Any of those things. By, by desire, you have to purposefully set that stuff aside. And one of the ways to start that is to say to yourself, every morning if necessary, throughout the day if necessary, I don't have to be right. I don't have to be right. Even if I am right, I don't have to be right. There's not a requirement. The only thing that being right brings to me is a sense of superiority. That little deceiving thing inside that one-upped somebody, because I just knew a little bit more than you. Or I set you straight. To use kind of a, a, a humorous illustration so that we don't get too personal and too far, we would probably talk about grammar Nazis. That's a funny thing. I can lean towards grammar Nazism, and, and I read things and I'm like, what? That was bad punctuation, you know, or whatever it is. And I want to correct somebody. You know why? Because I want them to be a better person. Nope. I want to be right. So what's the goal? The goal is that his love would live in us, reside in us, take up home in us. And our second nature would be that of, 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 the, of Jesus from the cross. That I love you and I care for you and I have your best interests at heart. Let's pray. Jesus, please pour into our hearts, first of all, an understanding of the necessity of this love. God, we don't want to do it if we don't think it's necessary. So show us that you are telling us it's necessary. It is, it is commanded that we be the loving people that you modeled for us. Lord, give us the wherewithal. And Lord, we need that wherewithal in the moment. It's in the moment when something flares up and we have to make a decision right now. Give us, give us the peace, give us the power, give us the presence of your Spirit to make that true. Lord, we love you. We want to walk with you. And we want the fact that we walk with you um, be evident to other people and change lives. Thank you for that, Lord. Amen. Amen. This is a great book. I love this book. Um, I, I would suggest that you be reading it. Just read First John, you know, over and over and over and, and get to know him. Look at that. What is this on my face? Has that been there the whole time? I love you guys. God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord. And walk as Jesus walked.